I was paying attention to people like yourself at the time that were blowing the whistle about this culture of uh, censoriousness and cancellation and call out culture. Um, but what I think my firsthand experience taught me on top of all those critiques was that it was a boring environment. It was actually, yeah. there was, it, it's like all, all these kids who, I was, I was actually very curious what they were thinking. And the reason I was curious is because no one raised their hands to say what they were thinking. There would sometimes be two to three comments toward the end of an hour and a half lecture class. And they would be very timid and just, you know, sort of cautiously agreeing. And I was so curious what people thought because we were discussing fascinating ideas, right? Like if Foucault is right, that is, that is a radical, it's, it's, it's the kind of idea someone has when they're on LSD or mushrooms. And it's, it would be super fun to bounce it around. Um, but there was no bouncing. Uh, and, and that's really what struck me most is that why aren't the kids complaining that this culture makes it more boring? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me about humor. Um, was there, looking back on your education, were there jokes, were there professors who made jokes where there was laughter in the classroom or was that not part of college for you? That's a good question. Um, I would say there was not that much humor that I can recall. Um, okay. Occasionally you would have it from, from like the first professor that I, I discussed. She, she, was, she could be funny sometimes. Okay, because um, what I'm, it's just a new thing I'm thinking about. You know how, I should go back and look at this, uh, you know, was it that birds were disappearing and DDT was the culprit or there's a, or so yeah, Silent Spring, of course, that's the, the Rachel Carson mm -hmm. book, Silent Spring. Because um, I've been realizing, you know, I think there's just, humor is gone from academic life. Like mm -hmm. when I got in in 1987, like there were a lot of jokes, mm -hmm. classrooms, academic conferences, it's just sort of normal. Like there, you'd find humor, somebody would tell a joke that has a punchline. I mean, um, academics was fun and funny and, and because everyone is so smart. You know, people right. have high IQs, they know a lot, they got quick minds. And so there was a lot of humor. And, and I'm just realizing like, I haven't really heard many jokes since about 2014, 2015. It's like, you know, this new, the, the new way of being, you know, and now we call it the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening came in. It was like, oh, no more jokes. You know, the, uh, the Committee on Morality has uh, ruled against jokes, so no more of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did feel like that. There, there, was, uh, there were occasional bright spots. I mean, I remember one intro philosophy class, I had a professor that would make some funny puns and some kind of philosophy jokes. But it really does not encourage pushing boundaries, that, that kind of right. a culture, because jokes by nature are you know, often transgressive. I, I just did a, a, a public event with, at the Comedy Cellar with Glenn Lowry, Roland Fryer, and four comics. Uh, oh my God, from. how did I miss this? That sounds yeah, amazing. The, you check it out on YouTube. There's Andrew Schultz, a oh. great comic was there, Shane Gillis, Sam Jay. And the, the comics ended up dominating um, the conversation as is their trademark. But you know, the, the point of the conversation was to ask the question, are there certain topics now that are more uh, adequately addressed in a comedic setting than in an academic yeah. setting on a podcast, in a paper, at a conference. Um, and that was sort of the launching point in the conversation. Cool. I will definitely check that out. I hope you can put it in the show notes. That sounds like an amazing conversation. And, and that fits with something I've been thinking about. Something I started thinking about when this, all this stuff started coming in is that what we should do at orientation, like here at NYU, um, you know, we have an incredibly tolerant university. Uh, you know, it's always been very, very progressive, very concerned with uh, identity issues and, and inclusion. Um, and yet, I'm told that many students feel you know, that they're in danger, that there's, there's verbal violence. Um, and, and it just, it seemed to me that if part of our freshman orientation was, you have to, you have to spend nine hours in a comedy class. And the reason why is because you will see comedians who are black, white, male, female, gay, and straight 
telling jokes about blacks and whites, men and mm-hmm. women, gays and straights. Mm-hmm. And if if you just get this up, like, you know what? You know, we're all different and there are foibles and, you know, you can take offense or not. But um, if you did that and then you come into a class at NYU, if somebody uses a word that isn't the exact right word, like you're not going to you're not going to freak out about it. So yeah. yes, let, we need more comedy in our lives and we certainly need it in our undergraduate students. No doubt. And I think part of my background that ended up clashing with the culture at Columbia was that I grew up in, you know, my memory of my childhood in suburban New Jersey, very diverse town. I had black friends, white friends, Jewish friends. Uh, and my experience growing up was that I would often make black jokes with my black friends like jokes that maybe if they came out of the mouth of a white comic out of context might seem offensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, I learned Jewish jokes from my Jewish friends. Mm-hmm. I learned Asian jokes from my Asian friends. And there was a there was a kind of good faith to the whole thing because we were friends to begin with. Yeah. And we, we knew these differences were not we didn't felt feel these differences matter deeply to begin with. So there was a harmlessness about it. And then to import that attitude into Colombia, I just felt like people are afraid to make any kind of joke because people now assume the worst. That's right. That's right. And yeah. So, you know, we, we spend so much time thinking about inclusion and how to make people feel included. Um, and, you know, if we could just foster an attitude of playfulness assuming good intention or assuming the best about people and um something about like a willingness to make mistakes or forgiveness i mean i can't there's a a small set of interlocked concepts that would humanize relationships and that would automatically reduce racism fear uh any any overt or covert acts of exclusion so Mm -hmm. yeah there are ways we could solve these problems and so many times it just seems we're doing the opposite of what we should be doing yeah um you know, one thing I, I notice a lot is my conversations, even about controversial topics, they always go well when it's one-on-one and face-to-face. Even after I published that blog post at Heterodox Academy, I started writing for Colette, and I was viewed as a contrarian on is- issues of race and racism. I don't think everything is all about racism, which was a contrarian take for many. Um But what I noticed is that even once I was known as this guy on campus that thinks the wrong things, my conversations one-on-one with quote-unquote social justice warriors were always really good. If there's no one else around, right, no one to perform for, no reputation at stake, people suddenly became quite reasonable and... um, and so I never had a problem with that. I, I, the problems came with social media, with a group conversation, with a classroom conversation, which is a kind of stage. Exactly. And there's something to be learned from that as well. Well, that's right. So to the extent that we're going to talk about my Atlantic article, my uh, article published in the Atlantic on April 11th, all of why the last 10 years of American life have become uniquely stupid. At least there's the illustration from the print edition. That's awesome. Um, that's the key, what you just said is, is the key idea. Now you put it as people suddenly became reasonable in person, implying that the normal state is on social media, but if you can take them off of social media and talk to them, they'll become reasonable. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, of course, for the last you know million, two million years, or whenever we got language, we've been having conversations not on social media and people are mostly pretty reasonable. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's only this weird innovation of saying, here's a way that you can talk. Now, there's already 500 ways you can talk. There's already, you know, telephones and the postal service and texting and, and, and you know, Skype and FaceTime and Zoom. There's, you know, there's a thousand ways you can talk. But here's a new way that you can talk in front of others. And it's not really that you're talking in front of others. You're actually just emitting stuff. You emit stuff. Others can respond to your stuff. It's all done on a stage. Um, And so Facebook comes out in 2004 and around then was MySpace and Friendster and all those other platforms. And you just, you post stuff on your wall or your room or whatever it is. And people come and they look at, that's all perfectly nice. No problem there. It's performative. 
but it's just like, you know, here's me, here are my photos. Um, and once Facebook makes it much more about the news feed, which it gets from Twitter, once it's much more about like, not here's what I'm doing, but like, can you believe this? And look at this outrageous thing. And then once you get the like and the retweet buttons, now it's about everyone's reactions to it. And then something I learned only after I published the article was threaded comments comes out in 2013. Threaded comments is not only do you get to say nasty, snarky things to any person who posts something, but now it says after each snarky comment, respond to Joe Smith. And so now, you know, you can have like Barack Obama will post something and lots of people say nasty things, but after each one is, do you want to fight with Joe Smith? And then yes, you do. And then before you know it, you've got a bunch of people with seven followers are now visible to anybody who sees Obama's post. Um, that happened in 2013. And there's a lot of things closing in on how 2014 is really the year that everything kind of really blew up. Things really went insane beginning in 2014. But to go back to your point, the metaphor that I'm using, I didn't put in the piece, but I'm thinking about it, is it's like, imagine if you know we wanted to communicate more, we wanted new ways to talk, and someone said, I've got a new way for you to talk. It's free, it's fun. Come, start talking, start posting, start performing. And you do that. And then you realize, wait a second, wait a second. There's like, we're in the Roman Colosseum here. Mm -hmm. And there's 100,000 people around us cheering for blood. And they want us to fight to the death. Uh, and if someone stabs someone, they cheer. And so we start stabbing each other more. Like, this is what, this is the situation we're in. So it's not that, you know, what if people, if you talk to them, they become normal. It's like most people are pretty reasonable, always have been, but you put them in front of the Roman Colosseum um, and you give them weapons. Yeah, some people become complete assholes. 